Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. This incident occurred about one mile below the Lewiston River Dam in a park service campground that was still closed for the season at the time. This is about five miles up the road from the town of Lewiston. I remember specifically that there is a fire base camp on the hill above the campsite. A creature was observed in dim light at a range of approximately 15 feet. The creature had an observable stature of at least eight feet, but the head itself was never seen. The creature was illuminated by the peripheral glare of our Mazda Navajo's low beam. As my wife was loading the car from the passenger side door, the creature seemed to walk down, then up a small distance, and then down to cross the road. It left a great variety of about 20 or so prints in different positions of locomotion over the terrain. The events were as follows. My wife and I were returning to our campsite from dinner at a restaurant in Lewiston at about 10 p.m. As we entered the campground, we noticed that our campsite was disturbed. For being a windless night, there was no reason that our eight-man dome tent should have been on its side with the contents spilled out on the ground and under the tent itself. We are in the habit of keeping everything in either the car or tent when we leave, so there is nothing else to mess up there. Another thing is that the tent was zipped up when we left and now was open. We parked and inspected the area around the site to see if anything was missing. After everything was accounted for, we decided that it must have been restless teens from the area just having fun. At this point, we decided to pack up and get a hotel room in town. Now, this is important. My wife and I had been camping already for about three weeks as we were on vacation. We had decided early on that if we saw or heard anything like a bear, we would just say to the other calmly, as fast as you can, please go to the car. My wife and I uprighted the tent and she grabbed the pillows and took them over to the car as I started to roll up our sleeping bags. After being gone for about two minutes, I heard her say, Stephen, as fast as you can, please just get to the car with the keys. She said it calmly, but I instantly could tell there was something really wrong with her. I dropped everything, and I just went to the car, started it, and we backed up and drove to the entrance of the campground. Now, this is what she saw. As she was putting the pillows in the back seat of our truck on the passenger side door, the camp was on the driver's side door, she saw some movement off in her peripheral vision in the glow of the headlights, about 15 feet from her. At first, she thought it may have been a deer, as we had seen several earlier that day in the area, and so she calmly closed the door enough to shut off the interior light and looked at the area of movement. The creature then appeared to stand up and started to walk away from her direction toward the river's edge. She only saw it for about two seconds, but she saw a definite human-like shape, mostly its back and left shoulder, and the impression of brown coloring. We also both recall a strong odor in the area that we could smell at times, but never paid any attention to. We discussed what happened. She was almost hysterical with fear, and I turned the car around and drove back and around the site with my high beams on. One feels a slight bit invincible in a big vehicle, even from big animals. We saw nothing, but nevertheless, we put everything in the car without even packing it and left. That night, we ended up driving to, I believe, Redding, which is 30 miles or so away, and stayed there in a hotel. The next day, we returned to the site and explored. I stood with my hand held up at the level she saw it, its shoulders, and luckily enough, it was under a major tree branch. 
The proportion of this thing really amazed us when we realized its size next to the tree. It apparently had approached and squatted at the base of this tree and watching us. And we are sure that it was what had gone through our tent and that we probably had startled it by returning when we did. The earth there was very, very hard and gravelly. We decided to look up by the road as there was a good embankment running along its length that the thing had to have crossed to get to our site. About a quarter mile up the road toward the dam from our campsite was a trail as plain as day on the hillside. The tracks were about one inch deep. There, where I, at 150 pounds, did not leave a trace of myself. On to the next story. My friend Larry and I initially ran across some evidence of a Sasquatch. Being in the area we were hiking, and the evidence turned into a full-blown face-to-face sighting in the later part of the hike. We had planned to hike the Cascade Head Trail on this particular weekend, and, as fate would have it, the weather was not exactly cooperating. There was a drizzle and fog, but, as it turns out, the conditions worked favorably in regard to the initial evidence we had found. Evidence which then had us on guard for the rest of the hike, which I believe was the cause of us ultimately seeing this creature. The two of us were well into the hike, and I must tell you that there are certain areas on this trail where boards were placed in certain areas alongside the trail to prevent erosion. They were also used to form steps, for lack of a better description, to keep the soil from washing away from the trail. We were entering the third such area during the hike where we encountered these boards and we were steeped in a dense fog that was enveloped the canopy which surrounded us. I must say, looking back, that it was a very surreal environment, which we found ourselves in. I really didn't give much thought to it then, but hindsight being twenty twenty, I mention it to you now. Some of these makeshift steps were close to 16 inches down, and they were buried in this mud-soaked soil. I was taking the lead on the hike, and from the looks of the muddy soil, nobody had been through here this day before we had come through. I was looking just ahead of where I was walking, being careful not to lose my footing on these steps, when I saw a huge impression in the muddy trail that was made perpendicular to the direction which the trail was heading. I called Larry up to where I was, and the two of us stood over and looked down upon what was mostly definitely a huge human-like footprint in the mud. It looked fairly fresh, and my reason for saying that is that moisture from the water soil was just beginning to puddle in the bottom of this singular track. We actually performed a little experiment in the mud nearby, stepping into it with our own boots to reproduce the same effect. Based on the results of our little test, our opinion was that this print had been made minutes before we had come upon it. The print, which was somewhat splayed out in the mud, was about 10 inches deep, which was three times as deep as our own experimental prints. We had caught it just in time to see the wide, stubby toe impression. Had we come along five minutes later, they would have been gone. This footprint had to be close to 20 inches long, and whatever had laid it down was a substantial creature indeed. The latest grizzly print that I had ever seen belonged to a bear that was about 1,500 pounds. That print didn't even come close to the size of this one. So I could only imagine what the size of the creature this print belonged to. In the moment, I looked at Larry and him at me, and our eyes, having not said a word to each other, told the tale. This was the footprint of a Sasquatch, and it was here with us in the woods. The two of us looked into the woods in the direction of the print was heading, and then we cautiously parted some of the wet undergrowth, stepping off the trail into the bushes. As soon as we entered the bushes, we heard something dart away through the trees, but saw nothing. 
I had already felt a cold shiver running down my spine when the reality of what had laid those footprints down connected with my mind. But when we heard whatever we heard run away unseen, I was quickly becoming the victim of a full-blown freakout. We continued onward, following the trail, until we reached a point where the ferns and the undergrowth were so tight to us that we were literally brushing them out of the way with our bodies as we passed through. It was then that Larry had said, Hey, did you just see that? I hadn't seen anything because I had been walking with my head somewhat down, so I asked him what he had seen. Larry told me he saw a dark figure appear in an opening in the bushes, and then it disappeared as soon as it had appeared. He pointed at a spot which was about 80 to 100 feet ahead of us, off to our right. We stood our ground for a moment, and then we slowly made our way forward to the spot where he said he had seen something. All of this while hearing nothing. Had I been alone that day, I would have retreated after seeing the footprint, but between the two of us, neither had even mentioned turning back, and so we moved ever forward. We reached a point where we were well out of the muddiest part of the trail, and we had come upon a spot where the trees on our right framed somewhat of a panoramic view of a hillside in the distance. In the middle of this so-called framing, which I just described, there was a pine which was considerably smaller than the surrounding trees, which was standing alone, rising above the brush which it was growing within. No sooner had we begun to look into the distance beholding this panorama than did this smaller pine begin to violently thrash back and forth. The tree must have been some 30 feet tall or more, with at least half of it being concealed by the surrounding brush and bushes, and it was being shaken back and forth like a whip, all of which was happening while the trees around it were dead still. The two of us were looking at each other as if to say, is this really happening? We had heard nothing and seen nothing, and yet... Here was this tree, some hundred feet or so away from us, being shaken back and forth like a cheerleader's pom-pom. This singular event had really gotten the two of us to think that the only thing capable of performing such an act would be a Sasquatch who had left the print we discovered earlier on the hike. The question was looming in our minds, was it in fact following us? When I tell you that we were getting a bit spooked by this whole affair, that would be an understatement. But to stop and head back or to move forward really made no difference at this point. The fact was, the day was starting to clear up, and at least in my own mind, I felt as though this thing might return to its lair at some point. If it was a Sasquatch, and that would be the end of it. But that thought process was about to change. It wasn't long after this tree shaking that I described when we found ourselves clear of the dense canopy of the forest. The sun was shining brightly, and there were still a lot of trees, but we were breaking out into some more open areas where there were large swaths of tall grass and bramble interspersed with pine trees. We had just stopped in front of a small sign which was placed on a stake in a field which read, Fragile habitat, area closed. Looking out over this area, it didn't seem much different than many other areas which we had seen and walked through, so we were wondering just what was so special about this area to designate it as such with the placement of this sign. There were a number of tall, bushy pines on our left side, and forward, our view was that of a field filled with weeds and some small trees. We could just make out a hint of the coastline in the distance and a bit of blue water far off in the horizon. It was then, without warning, that a huge brown-colored beast of unimaginable proportions came casually walking out from behind the trees, loping across this field in front of us some 75 feet or so away. I would guess that the brush which it was walking through was some five to six feet high, and its body was clear of it by perhaps four feet or so. 
As it walked by, without any hesitation, it turned its head slowly to glance directly at us, but kept walking. It turned away from us and disappeared down what must have been a slope out of our sight. We looked at each other and started to backtrack quickly, which, with neither of us being willing to stay in the area of what we were certain was a huge Sasquatch. As we walked and talked, both of us were fully convinced that this creature had intentioned for us to see it, first with what we were calling the warning of the tree shake, and second by making itself fully visible to us. To me, it was an ever-increasing show by this creature that it didn't want us there, and who knew how it may have ended had we stayed. For the entire hike back out, we had neither heard nor seen anything else, but we couldn't help thinking that this creature was stealthily watching us as we left its domain. The thought had also crossed our minds that perhaps there was more than one Sasquatch on either side of us. I say this because, after seeing the creature in the field, I was wondering if the singular footprint which we had seen earlier, as big as it was, was too small to be that of the creature we had seen walking. It had to have been some nine feet tall and 1,500 pounds, perhaps even more. It was absolutely massive. The upper body appeared to be virtually close to two feet thick from front to back, and its arms and hands were off the charts in both size and thickness. The head seemed to be directly connected to its upper body, and by that I mean there was no neck. It had turned its entire upper torso to look at us. Its face had what I would describe as an overhanging brow, and the nose was flat and broad. There was very little hair on the face, with the exception of what I will describe as hair above the lip and on the chin, giving it the appearance of having a scraggly beard. We made it all the way back to our starting point, with no further activity being seen or heard from the beast, and yet it had made an indelible mark on both of us, which is something I will never forget. On to the next story. Hello, my name is Taylor, and I saw a Sasquatch back when I was in junior high in the late 1990s. I grew up in a western suburb of Indiana, and after school, a bunch of us would walk over to the markets and load up on candy. I'm pretty sure I bought Sour Patch Kids almost every single time. We would always do this after-school tradition whenever it was nice outside, and even sometimes in the winter. It was a good way to flirt with whatever boy or girl you had a crush on. It was an autumn day, and eight or nine of us went over to this forest area that had a ravine winding through it. We were hanging out around the edge of the ravine, skipping pebbles across the surface and whatnot, when a large rock, almost the size of a boulder, landed on a plot of land right next to the ravine. Nobody saw the initial throw, but the thud was so loud that we all jumped. It was when the group of us started looking around in all directions that we saw what looked like a huge monkey raising its arms in the air and hooting and hollering in our direction. There was another, much smaller one, standing near its side. Whatever this thing was, it definitely didn't want us near what I'm assuming was its child. However, the child looked extremely curious and started making its way down the hill toward us and the ravine. The mother started making all sorts of crazy noises, as I think she was demanding that her baby return to her side immediately. Something that I always laugh about when I think back on it was how one of the boys that used to hang out with us screamed louder than any of the girls when the smaller little Sasquatch neared us. I got the impression that the animal just wanted to play, but I have to admit, its face was pretty messed up looking. It kind of looked as though it had been punched over and over, as its nose was crooked and it was missing a few teeth. Its lips were also very crooked. It sort of looked like some deranged Halloween mask, but it was anything but. The way these creatures moved about the rough terrain made it obvious that they were accustomed to doing it regularly. When the little one got closer to us, we all got a huge whiff of the terrible odor that followed it around. Those animals stunk so bad that it made me wonder 
is if it is intended to be some defense mechanism. It's one of those things that you can't comprehend until you smell it for yourself. Flabbergasted, we all scattered in various directions as the larger Sasquatch came down, snatched the smaller Sasquatch, and then ran back up the hill and vanished. That was the last we saw of either of them. We told our friends about what had happened, and the rumors began to spread like wildfire. It's amazing how inaccurate the story had become once relayed from one student to the next. Anyway, I was there, and I know what happened. The species is real. Don't let anyone convince you otherwise. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!